I'm very pleased to welcome everyone back today to um, day two of the annual IMTFI Conference for Funded Researchers. Um, if you're just joining us now, uh, my name is Bill Maurer. I'm the director of IMTFI here at UC Irvine, where I'm also a uh, professor of anthropology and law and the dean of the School of Social Sciences. And again, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this remarkable and unique event. Um, and I'll just underscore that again. I think people coming out of yesterday are realizing just um, how exciting it can be to throw people together from such diverse places and perspectives and disciplinary orientations, all to start talking about um, this one um, very complicated and rich issue area, um, the question of money and the changing technologies and infrastructures of money and how they impact um, the lives of the poor uh, and everyone else. So I'm looking forward to another um, exciting day today. Um, I did just want to uh, remind you of a couple of things first. Um, again, Liz from UC San Diego, who's here in the front, um, has been um, live blogging the conference. So if you'd like to see what she's been saying about what's been going on so far, you can go to imtfi.uci.edu and click on blog. And you'll see the entries up there from a couple of the sessions yesterday, and others will be um, going up as we go forward. Um, people are tweeting with the hashtag IMTFI. Um, so, you know, go nuts. Uh, <laughs> Keep it clean, and um, and I mean, and speaking of sort of keeping it clean, like I was really kind of thrilled that where the conversation went by the end of the day, where we got talking about you know dark money and um, what are the challenges of thinking about uh, digital money uptake when some of the things that people want to do are things that maybe we would consider bad sometimes, and the ways in which cash still lends itself to some of those bad things, which although they might be bad in quotation marks, still have value and sometimes have virtue for um, the people who we're, we're interested in, in studying and learning more about. I also just want to underscore again something Carol Benson said yesterday, and she unfortunately had to go um, and couldn't be here for the rest of it. But um, you'll remember Carol is the payments industry um, consultancy firm from, from Glenbrook, um, the firm. And she was saying again and again you know, how much it surprises her how little we know about actual behavior when you dig into people's wallets um, and dig more deeply into their everyday um, money practices and financial practices and how important the kind of work that's being generated here is to, um, to people like her as they then think about broader systems um, in the US and the rest of the world. So um, one other bit of housekeeping, and we'll see if, how well we can coordinate this and how quickly. At 10.30 this morning, at the start of the first break, a photographer from UC Irvine is coming to take a picture of all of us, a big group photo, and I think we're going to assemble out there on that patio that's straight back there. Um, and we'll see if we can do that quickly so that we can then um, enjoy the rest of our um, break. And also, um, some people have been asking about the dinner and dinner transport. Um, there's going to be shuttle buses leaving um, for the IMTFI fellows, moderators, um, and, uh, and other invited guests um, for the dinner at 5.30 and 5.45, leaving out front here. And that's going to take you to the, the place for dinner. And I'll announce that later, or Jenny will, or something. So without any further ado, um, let's get started on our first panel. I'm very pleased um, to welcome back to IMTFI Professor David Peterson, who's from our sister campus to the south, UC San Diego. Um, he is in the um, program in anthropology there, um, where he works on historical anthropology, transnational migrant life, remittances, and money. Um, and his book, um, titled American Value, Migrants, Money, and Meaning in El Salvador in the US, um, was published this past year by the University of Chicago Press in their interdisciplinary C series on Chicago studies and the practices of meaning. Um, David is a repeat offender here as a moderator for IMTFI, and I'm really pleased that he agreed to come up once again. So I'll turn it over to him. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you all, thank you Bill. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's always a pleasure to be here, an honor uh, to be here. I'm happy to introduce this uh, excellent 
panel. Our first speaker uh, this morning is uh, Nitya Joseph. Um, and the title of the paper is Silk Society's Gold Stories Using Gold-Based Life Stories to Study Gender, Financial Inclusion, and Work Vulnerability in South Indian Sericulture. Good morning, uh, I'm Nitya Joseph, and I'm going to present some work that I've been doing in um, a, a town in South India that specializes in silk reeling, um, so that's produced processing raw silk. And the work I've done um, includes gathering life stories of stakeholders across um, the subsector here. Um, and the, these life stories follow uh, the acquisition, ownership, and divestment of gold. Um, and and the reason I track gold is that um, it's both an important store of value in India, but also it's um, a material um, that's valued in multiple interconnected ways. Uh, there, there are social reasons for people uh, investing in gold, but um, also political, indexical, it's um, indicative of caste, relational, a, a measure of, uh, of status. Um, and so I, I'm following Arjun Apadurai, who said that uh, look at objects that, that are, don't appear to be ne necessary, um, not as luxuries and uh, unnecessary, but understand the semantics of the politics um, of necessity that are generated around, around them. And so and try to understand um, what that is telling you. Um, and, relate, and also related to that, I'm looking at oral history as methods and um, I see the gold object as a marker of memory, um, as something that allows you to go back 20 or 30 years and, and ask someone, what were your finances like at that time? Because um, you might not remember exactly borrowing and lending, but people remember gold that they owned. Um, and so, so gold then is a way of getting those stories and, and reaching those memories. Um, and then so that brings us back to then hearing uh, hearing finances in a way that's embedded in these narratives, which then reflect um, other aspects of every, everyday life. So um, what, is the social, what is the social group? What are the affiliations? What is religion? Uh, what is that impact? And, and so looking at all that, bringing it together to see what is that telling us about each of these stakeholders um, and what, they, um, what their social aff affiliations are telling us about where they are in this hierarchy um, and, and what it means for their well-being in this economy. So, um, so I, I start with that. Um, just, just a quick look at how the live story interview guide is structured. Um, so, so looking at life cycle events, a geographic location, earning and learning histories, um, and then a gold-based financial history um, of trying to understand these memories around gold. But, and, and then just to start off, I'm going to um, locate this one town that I'm working in um, along the silk production chain. And so the larger project for IMTFI as well is that I track um, gold stories across the production chain. Um, and, and so I just quickly introduce you to what that larger context is because I think it gives a sense for um, the particular social dynamics of this one town. Um, and and uh, and so while, while saying that, uh, before before I go into that, just quickly say that so the two things that I'm looking at is one is gold uh, is gold giving you giving us a way of understanding work vulnerability in this town, um, and the second thing is it is the example of this town give us an idea about how gold can be used as a way of understanding political economy in India. Um, so with that with that I start and. Um, so there's a, there's a saying in Canada that um, a silk sari before it's worn passes through 150 hands. Um, and in fact, if you look at the production chain, um, 150 seems like a conservative estimate because um, it's going from, agra from agrarian context where you have mulberry silk production where they're raising the worms to the market where cocoons are sold, there are people transporting the cocoons uh, to the factories where they're cooked and boiled and reeled, and I'll show you pictures of all these um, all these things as we go. Um, and and then to 
from reeling to twisting to weaving to um, to then to the the merchants who bring it uh, to retail units and at each uh, each level there are the intermediaries who uh, who are buying and selling the agents there's also state and para state the sericulture department which is um, regulating uh, certain aspects of it and playing a role in uh, raw, um, raw material markets subsidies and that kind of thing as well so just a, uh, just a quick look um, at the production chain which is interesting because of the fact that it moves one from uh, agricultural or uh, rural um, environment to semi-urban uh, to to then center of the city urban uh, big big cities like Bangalore um, and in, interesting for the second reason because it changes hands uh, in a way that changes caste and and class and religious affiliations so it goes um, from uh, the for, from a Hindu Gauda caste um, landowning sericulturists who are raising the silkworms. To, um, sorry, just one back. Um, show what's going on. Okay, so I, I missed the picture of the, the Gouda family, but um, so to, um, to a largely Muslim silk reeling, um, this is um, so Muslims and Dalits, um, and this is a, a lower class Muslims who are involved in the silk reeling, and but a slightly b a better off Muslims who are involved in the cleaner process of silk twisting, and then it moves to the Devangar uh, class uh, caste, uh, which is traditionally a weaving caste, who are still mainly involved in um, or almost entirely it's Devangars who are doing the sari weaving in Bangalore. This is the, the weaving, and and then to merchant castes were then selling these saris. Um, and about the raw silk subsector now, where where this town, where this town is located in, and um, there's another saying in Canada that uh, if the that in the silk industry, or, or when a silk sari is produced, ten people can eat rice, um, and eat rice. Imp implies both earn a livelihood but also prosper because eating rice, you're eating rice rather than the Im less expensive local millets like ragi. Um, and so, so there's 150 people involved in uh, getting the sari uh, to the consumer but, uh, te but 10 people eating rice and I'm not sure if the discrepancy uh, is intentional but in fact uh, the production chain uh, and the value added is um, highly disparate across the chain, um, and the silk reeling subsector, which in, um, employs Muslims and Dalits, is the is the sector which um, has the lowest value added and the most vulnerable uh, workforce. Both the both labor and capital is vulnerable um, because of the because of the process itself, uh, so dependent um, on agricultural inputs, the cocoons and and time is important because you can't leave the cocoons for a long time because then the worms will emerge from them. Um, so it's a lot of negotiating and in the, in the weather, uh, in rainy season when um, cocoons are abundant, silk doesn't come off the cocoons easily. Uh, so you need a lot more cocoons to generate a certain amount of silk. Uh, but in the summer when it comes off easily, um, then you don't get cocoons because there's no rain for the mulberry. Um, and so, it's, so they're a little bit caught in, um, in this loop and always just um, working at the margins of, of profit. So I quickly, uh, quickly show you the some pictures from this this town, which um, it has about th a thousand five hundred silk production units. The town is located between Bangalore and Mysore, and um, it, w it was first started during the colo uh, with when the British colonial administration took control of the area from the Muslim uh, ruler at the time, Tipu Sultan. Um, and they, this town is located around hills, and so the, the feeling was that um, there's a, a very interesting gazetteer um, from that from the 1890s, which talks about how uh, this town was set up to um, to make safe this wild and jungly tract, um, and so they relocated some people from uh, nearby areas and put them here. And at and at the time, Tipu Sultan had already started silk production. Um, in the area, bringing people from already global uh, 
inputs into the industry and um, the British colonial administration was as interested uh, in, in sericulture. So the town started with producing silkworms and then, um, and then by the mid 1850s was uh, using this, this basic hand charka uh, to produce raw silk. And so the cocoons are boiled, and then and then it gets spun on the device there. Mm. And um, and over the uh, till almost the eighty the nineteen fifties and sixties, this hand technology was commonly used. And I don't know if it has any relation uh, to do with the sort of Gandhian advo advocacy for hand uh, handwork and. Um, and cottage industry based functioning because uh, though there was a lot of interaction with, in, with the international sericulture um, and silk production, it took a long time for this technology to get implemented. But in the 70s, 70s and 80s, um, correlating with the sort of Nehruvian industrialization period, there was, then there was the, the filiature factory, which I think was French developed, um, was sta started being used a lot more. So here, this, this is the factories. Um, Done. Um, and so I could look quickly at the impact of uh, liberalization um, on both the silk and gold economies. And the silk and gold economies are both deeply interconnected in the town for at least the last 100 years. Capital um, from, for the silk industry comes from mortgaging gold. Um, any savings um, or surpluses from production are invested in gold. Um, and so, and um, with, with liberalization, what happened is that um, the with Chinese raw silk coming in, the market for Indian raw silk um, was se severely affected, and especially at two points when the Chinese silk first entered, and then when the import tariffs were cut. And but but a sort of middle level entrepreneur like the one in the picture here says, I had these problems, but I I shut down one of my two production units, but I'm still functioning. But there's a whole a whole series of people who have not been able to sort of make it through that period um, and return to a place where they're making profits after uh, now that they have to compete with the Chinese silk. And at the same time, what's happened is that the gold um, gold markets, which were heavily controlled, just like other imports were controlled in India, opened up. And so you have a whole range of jewelry units where earlier in the town there was one, uh, one uh, goldsmith who uh, was also the money lender and everything. Now there are over 40 units, um, also from people of different castes and um, also different religious groups. Lots of people are also buying gold. Gold prices are going up, so it still seems like a good um, investment. Also, uh, outside the town, middle class incomes have gone up significantly, and so um, there's a lot of a lot of money being spent on um, gold outside. So I. I now uh, will quickly share with you some stories uh, from, uh, some excerpts from the stories. And um, so one of the things is that along with this, there were both uh, surveys and some participant observation surveys of production units. And even there, when we were not asking about gold, we were being told about gold. So doing a survey about so how, is your, how is your production unit being functioning, there was once a lady um, who said, Okay, she was in a bit of a hurry. She had promised us that she we, she would talk the next day, but then when we got there, she wanted to. Um, she want she needed to go somewhere, so she says, "Okay, I'll tell you. Um, I'll tell you a story. My father-in-law's business was doing well when I first got married. There were f six functioning reeling basins, and he employed 15 people. We used to have 25 kgs of sanna sanna akki, which is fine rice, at any time, and we used to cook for all the workers every day. The women of the house never entered silk work. We had enough to do in the kitchen." Um, it, cooking for all the labor, and but then when the prices fell, we had big losses. First, my husband pawned my necklace for twenty thousand. Of that, he spent ten ten thousand on cocoons, eight thousand for the delivery of my first child, and two thousand for household expen expenses. Still, he made no profit, so he pawned my thali for thirty thousand. We spent twenty five thousand of that on cocoons. Then, how much was left? Five thousand. Um, it went towards paying back other loans we taken. Then a chit fund matured, so he used that money to pay back half the loan. 
um, for, the, for the tali and the necklace was too far gone, so he let that go. Then a second chit fund matured, 30,000. We were supposed to um, use the money to pay for the necklace, but then I got dengue, so, um, so, that, so 20,000 of that was used to pay for my hospital bills. Um, and then, and so how much was left? And she kept, she kept telling me these things and kept checking with me. So how much was left? Um, and I, had, I was just overwhelmed by the fact that there was so much, that gold was so much a part of um, capital about dealing with health shocks, um, uh, but, but completely unable to keep track of um, all her calculations, which she just had at the top of her head, like these earrings and those, um, and this chain. And, um, and so it was a sense that maybe even the, the right, um, right track. And I, another person, um, was, was saying that soon after my marriage, 17 years ago, my husband sold my tali for capital for his hand charka unit. He made profits and brought it back for me, but then later when I had my daughter, we had to keep her in the incubator for 10 days, so we sold it again. And she said, we always sell gold, we don't pawn it, um, because my husband says, why pay interest? You might as well get the full value for it, and then you can always buy again later. Um, but then they haven't bought another thali because they, they then their unit closed down and they started working as labor. Uh, but then she said that I always buy gold from Padrilal, who was the one original uh, Marwadi caste owner um, at, at the time. And she says he gives you good gold, uh, good quality. He gives you also, he buys it back at a good rate. Um, and also, uh, if you go to a shop and he's not there, you do, he, he'll call the bank and tell them, give you um, it, to give you the loan, that's the kind of pariche, that's the kind of recognition um, that he has. Um, other cases where you have a, fam uh, a man who was a, a silk reeling owner who then, um, who lost everything at the time where of, um, of the, when the prices fell, and um, so he, uh, he was, he said he's got his, his whole family working as labor, and so there's a move back uh, to family labor from where family moved out with the sort of industrialization and increasing of factory sizes. Um, and, um, and, and so, um, so uh, also other, um, another, another family, a woman said, I tied up all my gold, uh, the, d the day after the, we had severe losses after the, um, after this Chinese silk started coming in, we didn't eat for eight days, and after that, we tied up all my gold and my daughter-in-law's gold, um, and we gave it to repay our debt. And uh, we haven't been able to get it back. Her years have been empty since. But at the same time, there are um, there are other stories where you where we have um, someone who was working as labor, who then was able to use the gold that her daughter-in-law brought, and then gold prices went up a lot in 2008. So she's able to use that as capital. Um, for to start up her own unit, and she says, now we've brought back the gold double, more than double. We're doing well, thanks to Shiva. Um, so, so there's also uh, the, and also labor who uh, an example of someone who was working as um, um, who was working as labor, but in a very typical kind of uh, or a, an unusual patronage uh, based sort of relationship where she's got, she's living in a house provided by the employer. Uh, she's worked with him for 30 years, and she's been able to not use her earnings, but able to use microfinance loans to buy gold and hold gold, which she then pawns to buy, uh, she pa pawns it to buy gold, to, she uh, pawns it to give lend money to her family back in her village, and so she's able to be a lender um, in that way. Um, and. So but I think I'm uh, running out of time, so I can't share any more stories. Um, I'll just quickly wrap up uh, to say that the sense is that capitalists um, who were able to hold gold um, over this, this period following liberalization um, was, were, um, ha have been in a better place because they have money that they can pay to use uh, to keep their workers in debt, whereas other families who weren't able to f uh, keep gold uh, are vul uh, vulnerable similarly as uh, fam families with daughters who are not able to hold gold um, are also, uh, there is a link to the vulnerability, but to, to go further, just to look at the, the areas that I'm uh, thinking about, uh, looking at is one is gender, how does having a daughter versus a son, uh, just control of resources in the family, how is it linked to um, gold ownership, but also how are things like health shocks managed, how are, um, how has, how is caste, like Dalits becoming entrepreneurs, um, child labor, um, and child labor learning the skill and working and then starting their own factory versus working in the lib uh, 
new fact, new kind of uh, industries like garment factories, which have come about after liberalization. Um, and then, f uh, how has that changed, like the way the family um, structure and workplace vulnerability? Um, but also, finally, uh, looking at local politics and to see how because uh, how gold is linked to the economy there, because gold is required um, as um, uh, gold, is, you liquidize gold to pay the bribes you need to get people to vote for you, but also it's a, a reflection of status. So looking at all these different ways, and I think I've def uh, really exceeded time now, so I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just use this one. Um, our next uh, speaker is, well, speakers are Tiar uh, Mutiara Shantiuli and Salma Said, And the title of the paper is Banking with the Patron, the Case of Patron-Client in Makassar, Indonesia. Uh, my partner Salma Said couldn't make it to this conference. Um, I would like to present our preliminary findings for the research banking with patron case of Makassar, Indonesia. This is our, present, our outline of presentation. First, I would like to share the purpose of my study, initial finding and question. Just uh, first of all, I want to thank Bill Jenny and the Institute to make uh, the, the marvelous set conference here. Just to give you quick, just to bring you to, to the location it takes uh, 11 hours from uh, Irvine to Tokyo flight. And we have to fly Tokyo to Singapore, it's seven hours than Singapore to Makassar, four hour. So it's, um, to sum up, it's a 22 hours flight from here to Makassar. So the purpose of our, my study is to investigate factors that influence the survival of patron client relationship in the area of rural financial uh, institution. Uh, we use to, uh, we conduct the case study with a mixed um, unstructured interview and direct observation, and we choose uh, three sample, three location in Makassar, named Sudiang, Pacinongan, and Pasinampu, and we found the food hawker, physical cucumber divers. This is the Mustari uh, family. It's um, involved 120 people uh, to drive, a fried sales producer, cowhide crackers producer, retail game centers. This is owned by university student, uh, the landlord, and our f initial findings, we explore the how Patron client were initiated and development, including the recruitment, working arrangement, and banking mechanism. Uh, for the recruitment, um, there are a there has to be a similarity uh, for the patron and the client side, which is a kin kinship or neighborhoods, or in the case of a student, is the same faculty. Um, the patron client begin with the client borrow from the patron and the patron ask for help to the client without such any dependency from patron to client on this on some activities there will not be continuing relationship or patronage from the client 
these relationships should grow in many forms. The relationship could become the dependency of the client on third party. When, when this uh, relationship develops, the client will be depend on the patron in many dimensions that's related to the financial needs. Uh, for example, family member illness, new school year fee, and we can consider at, at that the clients treat the patron as their banks or insurance company. This one, uh, it's called marriages and other uh, religious um, payments. You can see that there is a, a ruler financial around them. The cooperative, the bank. Then I ask, uh, then we ask, why not banking with formal institution? And the, the answer is that the patron client, uh, pat the patronage is easier. The form of asset held by the patron, all the older generation are, are in the forms of plantation, livestock, cash, gold, and other jewelries that can be used to pay extra or unexpected un un expenditure both for the patron and the client. And for the uneducated younger generation, they are unbanked because they're not having an ID card. Mm -hmm. um, the further issue to be explored in the next step is how the termination of the patron client relationship. Uh, and we want, we also want to know the switching costs from patronage to business, if it is or if it is not, that we have to look deeply because of unsimilarity or because maybe it is another factor that we, we would look into. Something like happened in fried salad producer. Uh, she diversified her business to an cargo in Papua and Surabaya. Uh, we want to know, uh, is it a patronage or um, pure business? Thank you. That is a, that's all for the presentation. Okay, our third paper on this morning's panel uh, is presented uh, by the author Bridget Kusten. 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 And the title is Mobilizing Religion as Value Storage Islamic Microfinance in Bangladesh as a Model for Poverty Alleviation, with a question mark at the end. Good morning. Thank you to IMTFI, especially Jenny Fan, for all of her work. It's been a real pleasure to benefit from her timely assistance over the past few months. And also to my parents, who I haven't seen in a year and who made the drive down from the San Fernando Valley to be here. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so Islamic microfinance in Bangladesh, and the reason that there is a question mark there is because, for me, the central question here, and to preface, I'm about six months into the long duration of my dissertation field work with another year, year and a half to go, um, so this is still very much a work in progress. And my question is how Islam is being configured as a store of value, as an identity to be financially leveraged, such that one's economic and religious subjectivities, both for the client and for the employee of the Islamic microfinance institution, are being developed in a mutually reinforcing manner. And this is a, a working hypothesis based on the language of the Islamic microfinance program that I study and also the ways that the program is designed to explicitly develop the um, religious and economic subjectivity of its clients through various pedagogical interventions. So the bank that I focus on is the Islami Bank Bangladesh Limited, which was founded in 1983 and is the oldest and biggest Islamic bank in Bangladesh. And it, is, it started about 10 years after its inception, an Islamic microfinance program, which is now the world's largest and most well-established Islamic microfinance program. Uh, 
so first, what I want to do is put Islamic microfinance into the context of a whole constellation of um, structures in Islam that seek to um, mobilize a kind of ethic around financial activity. The first would be zakat, which is mandatory charitable giving in Islam. And uh, there have been a couple interventions in Bangladesh lately to really increase the way that corporations are paying out zakat to create more of a mindset uh, of, of corporate, a kind of corporate social responsibility of zakat payment. Uh, one such zakat conference uh, had a, a poster with the saying from Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, which was, zakat makes pure of one's mind and gives barakat or blessings on one's wealth and increases his wealth. So the idea is that the money that you give a zakat was never your money to begin with. It always belonged to God, and zakat is merely a redistribution of those funds. Uh, there's also the concept of sadaqat or voluntary charity, which um, is not a requirement, but is something that one gives to the poor, versus waqf, which is similar to a trust, where property or some other, typically land or other immovable property, uh, can be handed down over the generations, typically for a school, a madrasa, perhaps a masjid, a, a mosque. Uh, there's different kinds of zakat payment. There's regulated, so the Saudi Arabian government requires uh, individuals and corporations to pay a certain percentage. There's also semi-regulated, where in Malaysia, uh, citizens have an option to either pay non-Islamic income taxes or to pay zakat instead. Uh, and then there's also unregulated, unregulated collection, which is the case in Bangladesh, where Muslims are expected to donate, but there's no structures around how they do so. Uh, what I've observed in Bangladesh is that the way that Islamic microfinance clients conceive of their own level of poverty affects the degree to which Islamic microfinance can assist poverty alleviation. In other words, if someone identifies themselves as poor enough to receive zakat from others, then there is a willingness to take advantage of a multiplicity of Islamic programs, masjid programs that are out there in order to benefit, or uh, loan forgiveness programs from hospitals that are called zakat programs um, to alleviate their, the financial stressors in their life. Whereas if someone self-identifies as poor, but not poor enough to receive zakat, but instead as individuals who should be giving zakat to others in their community who are less fortunate, then the gains of Islamic microfinance in that case for those individuals are much more measured. So one of the questions that came up yesterday is, what do we mean by poor? Uh, a question I want to raise is how are people self-identifying and how does that impact the ways that they are taking advantage of different products and services that are available to them is issue number one. And issue number two would be, how does that bump up against the way that in institutions are making those decisions on behalf of clients and assigning certain designations of poverty uh, and how is that meshing or not with how individuals are self-identifying. As we all know, working in especially poor rural settings, there will be a nuanced gradation of poverty um, even within a, a single village. So I want to briefly go over what Islamic finance is because I don't want to take for granted we're all on the same page. Uh, so there are prohibitions or strong inclinations against the collection or payment of riba, which is typically translated as usury or interest, but I would refer everyone to uh, Bill's book, uh, Mutual Life Limited, for discussion of how riba is not technically interest, but instead is defined in the Quran as increase or as a process of increasing. And the picture on the left is a poster from uh, Jamaat Islami's uh, student wing, um, Islami Chatro Shabir, uh, which is, is Jamaat Islami is um, a political group that uh, exists in Bangladesh to promote Sharia law in Bangladesh. Uh, they support democracy, but they have a very uh, contested place in the Bangladeshi political sphere. Anyway, their student group has this poster that says, interestingly enough, uh, that people should not be taking shud, which is the Bangla word for interest. So Jamaat Islami student group is not using riba, although the Islami Bank Bangladesh Limited in all of its publications use the word riba. The reason this is important is because this already suggests a difference between the way that institutions are configuring Islamic finance, keeping it closer to the original intent of the Quran by using a word like riba, whereas even in a highly Islamic and often referred to as radical uh, group, at least that's how it's identified by
by the current government in Bangladesh, um, are not using a word like riba. They're using the Bangla word of interest. Uh, so there's already a distinction between how institutions versus clients are shaping what Islamic finance is. Anyway, uh, there's also engagement. Uh, there's a strong prohibition or sh strong inclination against engagement with haram or forbidden entities or industries, alcohol, pork production, uh, pornography. Uh, there's an inclination against gharar or excessive uncertainty. All financial activity is going to be uncertain, so the question here is determining a benchmark against which uh, an institution, the design of a particular product or service is crossing over into excessive uncertainty. There's also a prohibition against gambling. Um, but what's interesting about gharar, uh, excessive uncertainty, is that this needs to be weighed against the potential harms of non-engagement or opportunity costs, and this is being determined with very sophisticated models and formulas in the banks of Gulf institutions. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit more about how to locate Bangladeshi Islamic microfinance within broader flows of uh, Islamic finance globally because there's some interesting conversations surrounding that. So that's what Islamic finance is strongly disinclined toward. It is supposed to promote social justice, the idea being that there is, are sufficient God-given goods for humanity, but we are not distributing them equally, uh, although this is a very slippery concept. There's also a preference for the acquisition of assets over the stockpiling of money, keeping transactions pegged to a commodity, so equity rather than debt-based transactions, and also sharing risk. The key differences here surround risk, but new forms of risk are being, uh, are being created as there's new information asymmetries between clients and banks because of greater risk sharing models that exist. There's also a question of time and the future. Uh, one of my main theoretic concerns, which I'm not going to talk about today, is how to understand uh, the eschatological implications of Islamic finance, meaning how does the remembrance of death uh, impact the way that certain presumptions around certain products um, are being shaped and being developed. There's a question of intent. Something that keeps uh, coming up with my interlocutors is that the purity of one's Islamic intent will shape the kind of experience they have uh, with the Islamic bank and will come to shape how much profit, how much loss comes to be received. That the starting point is truly the Islamicness uh, of intent. Again, a, a slippery concept, but one that is referred to frequently enough by interlocutors to not be ignored. The question of penalties, how you can leverage a penalty against someone without it constituting riba or interest. Uh, this idea that money cannot beget money is also a sticky concept. Uh, and then there's a question of accounting. So how to account for the fact that in Islamic finance there will be times when money bumps up against interest-bearing money. For the Islami Bank Bangladesh Limited, this falls under the rubric of doubtful income, a term used in English. Uh, exclusively, and this is a predictable uh, expense on the profit and loss sheet where a certain amount can be uh, predicted every year to count as doubtful income because it has come into, con uh, come into contact at some point in time with interest-bearing income. Um, now, Islamic microfinance raises questions about to what extent outreach to the poor can and should be the point of an Islamic uh, finance institution. This becomes significant because as very well-funded institutions in the Gulf are pushing up, pushing up against the boundaries of what is Islamically permissible with respect to excessive uncertainty and gambling, uh, there is a way in which at various professional conferences I have attended, Islamic microfinance is something that the wealthy Gulf institutions keep pointing to as the way for the industry to continue to burnish its ethical credentials. So there's a, a sense in which what's happening in Bangladeshi villages with regard to the development of sophisticated Islamic microfinance products is of deep interest to Gulf institutions that are being subject to all sorts of critiques, not just from conventional, conventional bankers, but from Muslims because uh, the most common critiques are uh, you have all these sophisticated accounting techniques, but really it's just interest by another name. What you are doing is haram to try and encourage Muslims uh, to bank with you. You're just trying to capture greater market share. Stop trying to couch your own capitalist impulse to make money in the language of Islam. Um, but what's remarkable about the Islami Bank Bangladesh Limited, which is a commercial Islamic bank that then has this separate Islamic microfinance program, is that the bank itself has in its mission statement a dedication to welfare-oriented banking, which suggests a true reorientation of the, of, um, of 
the point of economic activity. Uh, and this is not true for most Islamic banks that will say, okay, our point is to follow what the Quran says we have to do down to the rules, but we're still not going to have an avowed uh, focus on the lives of the poor. And that's not the case of this bank in Bangladesh. So my question is, does this make an, ex an exceptional institution within global Islamic finance? Uh, and this requires to some extent untangling currents in Bangladeshi Islamic finance from global Islam trends in global Islamic finance, as I was discussing, and also the fact that um, it has this connection to Saudi Arabia versus the continued support of the Islamic Development Bank, which is like the, um, like the World Bank, but for Muslim countries located in Saudi Arabia. Their own funding preferences are notoriously opaque. There's not a lot of uh, reports that are being issued that talk about goals, preferences, strategies behind the Islamic Development Bank's uh, decisions of what to fund and what to not fund. Uh, but they are consistent supporter of this particular program, a member from the IDB um, or, and other Saudi financial institutions sit on the board of the Islami Bank. Uh, and this is, this, this is significant because of the contentiousness of the Islami Bank in Bangladesh, uh, which is taking place at a point in time when there's a lot of contestations over the place of public and political Islam in Bangladesh. Um, the war, there's a, the 1971 war between Pakistan and Bangladesh is yielding war crimes tribunals that are happening in the present. Um, in response to these tribunals, there were mass protests in February uh, calling for a death penalty of an individual who had been uh, condemned to life in prison. In response to these mass protests happening in Shabak Square, there was the rise of a group, Hafazat the Islam, which took out another series of protests in Dhaka, chanting slogans such as um, which means don't kill dogs or cats, don't kill atheists, but butcher them instead. So there are all of these various um, shifting configurations of pro or anti uh, public Islam groups and Islamic finance is very much caught in the crosshairs of all of this. In February, there was a, a run on the bank uh, related to these mass protests against the war crimes tribunals. The bank was able to regain stability, uh, but this draws into question, what do we do with poor clients in the midst of all of this who um, aren't necessarily, are, are seen to be rather innocent by virtue of their poverty, but are still beneficiaries of the Islamic bank. So I conduct my field work in a coastal town called Cox Bazaar, uh, named for Admiral, Admiral Cox, who came to Bangladesh several uh, hundreds of years ago. Uh, it's a multi-religious part of the country with high numbers of non-Islamic uh, Islamic microfinance clients, a lot of Hindus, uh, Buddhists, both Bengali Buddhists and ethnically Burmese Buddhists, uh, Christians as well, which disrupts certain national narratives of Bangladeshi identity and presumptions about a typical Islamic microfinance client as being a radicalized Jamaati Islami supporter or uh, Shibir supporter. Um, Cox Bazaar also has a reputation as a stronghold of Islamic political party activity, uh, particularly Jamaat the Islami. So the big concern of the secular government is that if you have a poor, if you have a poor um, clientele and you help foster allegiance to your institution as an Islamic institution, this then will have a mutually reinforcing relationship with the local Jamaat the Islami party. Uh, this is this is the conspiracy theory, at least. Uh, and this is also the premier tourism destination of Bangladesh on the Bay of Bengal, but it simulta simultaneously possesses the lowest development indicators due to the Burmese Muslim refugee population, the Rohingya, who have been coming to Bangladesh for over 30 years and uh, occupy an extremely marginal position in this area. Um, photos of the field site, semi-rural. So, okay, this is to some extent all been background of why the project, where, and uh, to what ends. Uh, as I said, the main question here is how do we privilege the perspectives of the institution versus the client in something like Islamic microfinance? Uh, the reason that this is significant is, um, aside from these issues of how the poor self-identify versus how the institution will identify the poor, is that, um, is that the, the way that Islam, going back to my initial, the provocation of is Islam a type of value storage, is that the way Islam is being mobilized and conceived of by institutions and by the clients 
thus far is, is markedly different. So the administrators of Islamic microfinance consistently refer to their duty in eschatological terms. The remembrance of death motivates their desire to work in this non-lucrative and extremely labor-intensive industry. So sentiments such as, I do this work because I receive my reward in the afterlife, I do this work because you know, God will demand an accounting of me, are extremely common sentiments that are, that are expressed. And this is why uh, officers profess to be supporting something like Islamic microfinance. Whereas clients fairly consistently refer to God and their own Islamic positionality in the context of, God knows my sufferings. I already have a surfeit of credit in the holy account book upon death due to my pre-existing poverty. So God already knows my sufferings. Islamic finance is nice, it will be a bonus toward my own actualization as a good Muslim, but the economic benefits are central. In other words, the Islamic bankers have a highly idealized uh, understanding of what Islamic is due, of, of what Islamic microfinance is accomplishing and why it should exist. The poor prefer it because uh, in a landscape dominated by the Grameen Bank, uh, the interest rates, which charge high interest rates due to its structure as a cooperative, um, this Islamic microfinance program charges a lot less. So it's simply a better financial choice for poor clients to be using this. Uh, in other words, um, they believe that Islamic microfinance should exist for the sake of banking institutions rather than for their own personal sake. So what poor clients are expressing is this idea of God already knows that I'm suffering, I am already going to receive my rewards in the afterlife, however, Islamic microfinance is something good for Bangladesh. As Muslims, we should have interest-free banking. So the poor are conceiving of their Islamic subjectivity as entities who can help richer Muslims to do their Islamic duty, um, rather than poor clients embracing Islamic microfinance for the sake of their own Islamic well-being. And what's interesting is this, is that this is an extremely local, small, Cox Bazaar dynamic that is playing out on this international level, where again, Islamic microfinance provides a way for richer Muslims to do their proper duty by underwriting, by supporting in various ways, Islamic microfinance, which can, like I said, burnish the overall ethical credentials of the industry. So what this gestures toward is a sense of community in which the poor and the rich are aware of the fact that they both need each other in order to have a fully developed um, Islamic subjectivity that at the moment of death will allow for benefits uh, to be gained. I didn't have time to talk about this, but um, the program also stresses the religious education of its clients. When field officers visit, they give, or, they give lectures on certain facets of Islamic practice, how to pray pop properly, how to do wudu, how to cleanse yourself before prayer, the meaning of Ramadan. So there's this desire to kind of build up clients as better Muslims via the, um, the moment of repayment um, with the group lending models. Uh, the other big difference that, that is significant uh, with respect to the position of creation of mutually re reinforcing Islamic and uh, economic subjectivities is what to do with the question of female empowerment versus family upliftment. So in this landscape dominated by Grameen Bank, which has had a signature focus on, on female empowerment, a term that is much critiqued but is still in play, uh, the Islami Bank focuses exclusively on family upliftment and it has certain presumptions about family structure that then work its way into the interaction between the loan officer and the client at times of repayment that work its way into criteria for being eligible for loans. Um, so that is your introduction to Islamic microfinance in Bangladesh. Thank you. Okay, our fourth paper on this panel, and I thank everyone for being so on time. Uh, we're moving along at perfect schedule. Um, this paper is titled, How Does Mobile Money Affect Adopters' Social Networks? Uh, and it's uh, completed by Alfredo Berlando and Cynthia Kinnan. And Cynthia will be the presenter? Or? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll both be okay, presenting. Okay, great. I'll just gonna, uh, start. Uh, okay, so let me echo everyone else on the panel in thanking IMTFI for this, this uh, Really great opportunity to, to come together and meet meet uh, meet everyone here and and uh, talk about and, and get feedback on on our work. 
I, I should say, although this will uh, I think become clear, that this is this is very much work in progress. We've just completed our uh, baseline survey and are, are implementing our uh, randomization as, as we speak. So we're very much still in a position where feedback is uh, is is, uh, is is very uh, very useful. And uh, and I should I should mention that our, our third co-author, who wasn't able to be here today because she's uh, teaching as we speak, is Sylvia Prina of Case Western University. Okay, so this. Um, this is just a, a quick visual overview of the, the product that we're going to be uh, talking about today, which is a, a, a easy pace of mobile-based uh, banking uh, banking product. And so I think the, the things that are uh, worth uh, worth worth looking looking at in this in this advertisement uh, used by Xantel, who is our partner in this project, uh, are that uh, <coughs> is a, a cell phone and, and also a SIM card. So this is a, a banking product that can be accessed through a, through a mobile phone, but it can also be accessed uh, just through the uh, uh, just with the use of a, a SIM card that can then be taken to a, a retailer and uh, you can check your deposit, you can check your balance, uh, make deposits or make, make withdrawals in, in that way. Okay. okay, so just by way of a little bit of, of motivation, I, although this probably isn't, isn't very necessary for, for this audience, there's, there's been, uh, I, th I think over the last uh, uh, decade or, or, or so, uh, a, a growing act em emphasis on the use of, of savings uh, as opposed to or in addition to, to credit as, as a way to uh, help poor households achieve various of their financial goals. And so some of the uh, goals that, that, we, uh, that it's hoped that access to formal savings can help households uh, achieve, so one is consumption smoothing, which, which, you can, which I think dovetails nicely with the comic book example that, that we saw yesterday, that is you put aside money in, in periods when, when uh, things are relatively good and then you have access to that money uh, when, when things are... Uh, when you're, when you're faced by, by a shock. Uh, uh, related to that is uh, the possibility of using formal, formal savings as a way to invest in health and education. And again, we sort of saw that in, in, the, uh, in, in the, the comic book e example, that uh, uh, having resources available when you have a health shock or, or to invest in preventative care or uh, vaccinations, things, things like that. Uh, and then also uh, there's a, a hope or a belief that access to formal finance can be helpful in uh, starting or, or growing uh, uh, income generating ac activities. And I think it's uh, sort of worth, worth pointing out or worth keeping in mind that part of, I, th I think part of the increased emphasis in the, uh, the possible role that savings can play in sort of helping the poor reach their financial goals is, uh, is the sort of uh, results of a number of recent microfinance evaluations, including one that I've been involved in, that have been sort of more mixed or more nuanced than, than I think a lot of uh, microfinance proponents had, had, had hoped. And they're sort of uh, mixed or nuanced both on the, the margin of uh, take up. So generally in, in all of these studies uh, mentioned here, which cover uh, Morocco, Mongolia, uh, Mexico, Bosnia, and, and India, uh, take, up, take up of microfinance has, has been, been low, which suggests that, that the, at least the traditional microfinance product is not for everyone. Uh, and also even among those who adopt, the, the effects seem to be relatively uh, modest and, and nuanced, which is not to say that they're, that they're not uh, important. Okay. So, so so within that sort of framework of, of thinking about access to savings as potentially being important in, in facilitating uh, financial, uh, helping poor households achieve their financial goals, uh, it seems like uh, mobile, mobile linked uh, savings might play a particular role. So we, uh, and again, I probably don't have to uh, belabor this point to this audience, but they have the potential to, uh, to, to have much greater outreach, to be uh, accessible in, uh, in, uh, in, in areas that are, that are not, uh, that don't have a, a formal, uh, a brick and mortar uh, bank branch, uh, they they may, although this is not a given, also be available at, at lower cost by uh, by uh, sort of leveraging the, the technologies of, of the mobile model to, to bring down uh, costs. And this we we know uh, there's a growing body of evidence that this may be particularly important, uh, as evidence shows that uh, barriers like cost, convenience, geographical access uh, are significant barriers uh, discouraging adoption of, of traditional savings accounts. And this has been uh, documented. Uh, on a number of recent studies, in, including a, a study by our co-author Sylvia Prina in, in Nepal. Okay, so that's that's sort of the, the background of the of the research question that we're going to be particularly interested in, which is which is whether and, and how uh, access to formal savings may may have uh, important spillovers for members of of the social networks of households who who adopt uh, these savings products. Uh, so, and just just to be to be clear, we're, so we're, when we're, we're talking about spillovers from from savings access, we're going to be thinking about either benefits or costs experienced by households other than uh, other than the household making the decision uh, to adopt the account uh, or or not. And we uh, 
part of, uh, part of the reason why we've, we've chosen to conduct this study in, in a, in a peri-urban context is that we know, again, from a, uh, a large body of literature that the informal financial transactions that link uh, different members of, of, a, of a community or social network are particularly common and important in, uh, in rural and peri-urban contexts, both, both because social networks may be, uh, uh, may be uh, uh, sort of uh, deeper in these contexts because of lower rates of, of migration, uh, for instance, and, and also because of the absence or the uh, uh, reduced access to formal financial mechanisms like, like savings or, or insurance. So at, at a broad level, the research questions that we're interested in, uh, in, in exploring in this project are first, do these spillovers exist? Are there actually ef effects experienced by non-adopting households when, when adopting households uh, uh, get access to, uh, to savings? And if these spillovers exist, are they, are they positive or negative? And, and does the answer to that question uh, differ uh, across different, different members of the network? Okay, so what, what types of spillovers could, could we expect to see from, from the adoption of, of savings? And, 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 uh, and it's sort of uh, to, to understand why, why empirical evidence is, is necessary here, uh, theory and, and past empirical evidence give us, give us reason to expect that we could see both positive and negative spillovers from, from the adoption of, of savings. So on, on the positive side, we know uh, we, we have, we have uh, increasing evidence on, on two, um, uh, uh, two, two facts. One is that income gains, whether they come from a conditional cash transfer or from, uh, from sort of self-generated self uh, income, uh, appear to be uh, shared among social networks. So this was shown uh, in an influential paper by uh, Manuel Andalucci and uh, Giacomo de Giorgi, uh, showing that progressive recipients in, in Mexico, or I guess it would now be Oportunidades recipients, uh, share the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gains from the conditional cash transfer with ineligible members of, of, their, uh, of their communities. And uh, so we, and we have reason to think that this uh, income sharing mechanism could, could conceivably be activated by access to savings because of another body of evidence that suggests that savings, savings access uh, does appear to lead to significant income gains for adopting households. And again, this has been shown uh, by, by Sylvia Prina in her work in, in Nepal, by Pasquin Dupont, uh, Don Robinson in, in their work in Kenya, uh, and, and by others. Okay, so, so far so good. That seems to suggest a, a mechanism whereby we could, we could see uh, positive spillovers. However, there's, there's also a possibility for, for negative spillovers or for the, uh, the social networks of, of adopting households to be, uh, uh, to be negatively affected. So, uh, so there's, there's sort of a theoretical body of, of work that, that suggests that access to savings may uh, sort of weaken the reciprocal motives for, uh, uh, for continued participation in informal uh, gift, and, gift and loan exchange networks uh, sort of through the, through the, through the theory of, of limited commitment. And that, uh, uh, that was sort of uh, shown in, uh, in work by uh, Ethan Legan et al. and, uh, and also by, by others. And then also on, on, the, on the empirical side, we've, we've seen evidence, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in East Africa, that households do appear to uh, attempt to avoid kin taxes or avoid the pressure to, uh, to share, share income with particular members of other social networks and will even uh, pay, pay money or, or uh, incur other costs to, uh, to, to do so. And I think we heard about an interesting example of that uh, yesterday with the, the mention of uh, the, uh, the Somali migrants who, were, uh, who wanted to um, uh, use, use banks outside the Somali uh, uh, migrant community to, uh, to, to shield, shield that, that income. And so, so both the positive and negative uh, potential spillovers of financial access could be, could be magnified by mobile savings. So on, on the positive side, again, if, if mobile savings uh, lead to both uh, uh, greater take up or uh, greater economic benefits because of reduced fees or easier easier access we may we may uh, uh, we may we may see greater potential for uh, for positive spillovers but on the other hand if mobile if mobile savings is either more more discreet to use or if it's easier to sort of get your money into mobile savings before there's an, a chance for it to be taxed by the community taxed quote unquote uh, then we may also see greater potential for for negative spillovers Okay, so, so I'm uh, next going to talk about some of the key hypotheses that we're interested in testing in, in, this, in this research. Uh, so, I've, so I've already alluded to the fact that different members of, of a social network may experience these positive and negative spillovers to, to a differential effect, and so some households may have a net positive uh, spillover effect when other members of their network uh, obtain access to, to savings, uh, while, while others may have a net negative effect. So, uh, we're, we're going to distinguish, and, and I'll, uh, I'll leave to Alfredo the, the challenging task of, of explaining how we're going to uh, differentiate between uh, altruistic and, and obligatory ties, but take, take as given for the moment that we're going to uh, think about two different types of ties, altruistic ties or ties that are uh, uh, sort of su sustained by 
primarily by, by notions of, of altruism uh, versus obligatory ties that are, that are sustained uh, more by, by a sense of, of obligation. We hypothesize that altruistic ties are going to be more likely to experience net positive spillover uh, uh, effects when, when other members of their network get the opportunity to, to adopt a, a savings account, while obligatory ties will be more likely to experience uh, negative benefits. We're also interested in understanding whether network interactions shift away from these obligatory ties, either uh, uh, to altruistic members of the network, uh, or to, to, to new ties, or just maybe, maybe displaced toward uh, intertemporal trans, uh, transactions rather than interpersonal transactions. And then sort of a, a corollary of, of, of the, the first two hypotheses is that if obligatory ties uh, are, are in general uh, members of the community that are poor to start with, access to formal savings could potentially widen inequality and then because we, we know at least theoretically that inequality, widening inequality can uh, increase the potential for these uh, negative spillovers, we could potentially have a, a vicious cycle uh, uh, sustained by, by changes in, in inequality. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so these are, these are the, the hypotheses that we're hoping to, to provide empirical evidence. Okay, so I'm just gonna sort of uh, start telling you a little bit about what we've, uh, the, the setup of, of the experiment, and then Alfredo will, uh, will come in and, and uh, to talk about uh, what's, what's yet to be done and, and where feedback is especially uh, welcome. So we're, we're conducting this study in partnership with Zantel, who's uh, Zanzibar's leading, leading mobile phone operator, uh, Zanzibar being uh, uh, composed of, of two islands off the coast of, of mainland uh, Tanzania. And we're, uh, we're, we're uh, evaluating their Easy Pesa product, which is the product that I, that I mentioned before. It's, it's the product that you, that you saw the picture of that allows households uh, to make deposits and withdrawals, uh, either through their phone or uh, with the use of a SIM card that they can take to, to a retailer. So uh, currently, and this just provides the opportunity for, for our research design, the product is not yet widespread outside uh, Zanzibar town, the capital, uh, and that's, uh, that area outside Zanzibar town is, is the area where we will be, uh, where we're doing our study. So we've, we've selected, uh, actually that should be 30, 34 peri-urban areas where we'll be conducting the experiment. So uh, the experiment is conducted as an oversubscription design, which means that we, uh, we, we went to each of these communities and through uh, posting flyers and enlisting the help of, of the shehar or local leader, we recruited individuals who were interested in, in getting uh, assistance in opening a mobile, a mobile savings account. And we, we, we explained during this initial recruitment process that signing up to participate in the study gave, gave, gave each household roughly a 50% chance of, uh, of receiving uh, help in signing up for Easy Pesa that, uh, in a form that Alfredo will, uh, will, will explain. And on average, uh, 50, 50 households signed up per, per area on average over the 34 areas, giving us a total sample of just under uh, 1,700 households. So with that, I'll hand over to, uh, to Alfredo to talk about uh, the marketing visits and where we're going next. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. So, so far you've heard about um, our plans, what our hypotheses are, and now we are talking about what's happening starting next week, uh, which is uh, we've already conducted uh, these, uh, um, uh, these uh, uh, recruitment of approximately 1,700 individuals. And now what we're doing is we'll be, we're going to be uh, choosing 50% uh, of those individuals to receive uh, a, a marketing visit. Uh, the marketing visit will um, be carried out by uh, marketers uh, specially trained by Zantel. Uh, uh, they will visit households uh, that were interested in signing up to the, or participants to the study. Um, uh, they will visit them within, uh, in, in the context of their, of their home. Um, and uh, in, in, during this visit, several things will occur. Uh, first, the marketer will uh, explain how mobile savings work and how they can use mobile uh, savings and, uh, to, to save money and put money aside. Um, uh, second, they will try to sign up uh, these, uh, these households uh, to, the, to the product. Um, the, the product itself can be actual, actually different things. Uh, if the household has already a cell phone, uh, they can, with, with Zantel, um, an Zantel operated cell phone, uh, the product will be uh, essentially um, to um, habilitate the uh, Easy Pesa within that cell phone. Uh, on the other hand, if the household doesn't have a cell phone, 
uh, or wishes to have a separate account that is separate from the cell phone, um, the, uh, the, the marketer will provide them with a, with a SIM card and they will register the SIM card under the name of, of, uh, of, the, of the interested individual. If more than one person in the household is interested to take up an account, uh, say, you know, the, the wife is the one that was interested, but then during the marketing visit, uh, the, the husband say, hey, actually, this sounds very interesting. I would like to have uh, to one. Then the marketer will also provide a second, uh, um, a second account to the husband. Um, um, with, we, with, with this methodology, we are not going to be able to really explore too much what are the dynamics within the household, uh, uh, which is uh, a little bit unfortunate, but on the other hand, uh, our, our primary task is to uh, understand spillovers outside of the realm of the household. Um, uh, the, 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 the final aspect uh, that is uh, important here is that once the household is provided with the savings, uh, with this uh, SIM card or, or uh, uh, easy pay habilitated account, um, we will make a transfer of uh, uh, 2,000 shillings, approximately $1.25, into the account. And uh, what we want to do with that is essentially encourage the, uh, the, the, the beneficiary to, um, to actually go to, the, uh, to, the, to a retailer, uh, and if they want to have access to, the, to that cash, they will have to experience Easy pays uh, at least once, and so we hope to really try to get them to uh, um, uh, experience the product, uh, and, and hopefully that will lead to subsequent use of the product. Uh, the remaining half of the community, or the remaining half of the of the groups that are interested in uh, savings, are not going to be uh, given, are not going to be provided with any savings. They will uh, instead simply receive a cash payment of 2,000 shillings as compensation and also as a way to keep the transfers given to uh, the, the treatment households that are receiving the accounts uh, similar to the transfers that they received from us from the, uh, the, in, in, uh, uh, to the control. Um, okay. So, uh, th so this is the experiment, and essentially what, um, but th again, the objective of the study here is to try to understand what is the impact of these accounts, not on the person, on the, on the households that take up these accounts, but on their relations. So for us to really try to get ahead or uh, make headway on that, on that research, we need to figure out a way to uh, understand who are uh, the ties, what are the social ties of these uh, adopting, possibly adopting individuals. So before we actually carry out the randomization, we just finished, uh, uh, as of today, really, the, 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 the process of uh, carrying out a baseline survey of possibly adopting households. And um, we collected a, a set of data uh, that includes some basic uh, socioeconomic characteristics of the adopting households, such as income, occupation, education, and things like that, family structure. And then we spent, we devoted quite a bit of time trying to understand illicit information about uh, their social ties. Um, and, and, and we did this in two, in two parts. And the first part of the questionnaire was really trying to uh, elicit as many names of ties as we could, as we could uh, people that are important to the, uh, to the, to the, to the respondent. Um, uh, we started by looking at, uh, asking questions about uh, uh, people in the community within the village with whom they exchange um, money, um, either through uh, gifts or through loans. Um, and, uh, but then we went beyond that and we looked at um, the particular um, um, other aspects such as uh, who, is, uh, who do you spend time with, who do you seek advice from, who do you give advice to, uh, and also some other questions that try to elicit information about trust and whether or not there are some people in the community that you particularly do not trust. And we did everything uh, using PDA, so you can see in the picture here one of our interviewers with a, with a PDA, and using the PDA uh, allowed us to actually generate a set of, um, um, allowed us to enter all the data and then we had an algorithm within the PDA that essentially plucked four, particular, four names, four ties that according to us, the researchers were potential uh, obligatory ties and particular uh, potential um, altruistic ties. And then we did some more additional uh, questions on those four ties. And finally, we asked the individual to rank those four ties in terms of trust. 
uh, and in particular, we asked them, imagine you got a surprise payment of uh, 100,000 shillings, approximately $60. Who would you want to keep this secret from? And we asked them to rank those four names by, uh, by, by most to least. And, uh, and, uh, um, and so on. So that way we were able to self-select uh, two prominent ties, one obligatory and one altruistic. Um, I don't have a lot of time at this point, so let me go through, uh, um, here you can see uh, some of the baseline characteristics that we were just collected. These numbers are probably going to change a little bit. Um, uh, on the altruistic and obligatory ties, we have um, uh, we, it seems from the preliminary data that um, the people that you have altruistic relations with, uh, you've known them for a longer period of time. Uh, you're more likely to be uh, a closer relative as opposed to, uh, to a neighbor. Uh, uh, and, um, um, and they're more likely to lend you money in case you need money. Um, and uh, we've seen that um, uh, the, uh, instead of the obligatory tie tends to be more of the same sort of the same wealth level of the respondent. And, uh, and they're more likely to be neighbors or acquaintances. Um, the timeline of the project, we uh, will be concluding the, the we, we're essentially finishing in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, we're gonna take a break for, uh, for eight months and then uh, we'll come back in August 2014. We will interview uh, Focal, uh, the, the households that, we, that, uh, that were in the treatment and the control group, as well as the ties of their network, so the particular uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the two ties that they've self-identified as being um, uh, obligatory or altruistic. And then well, the measurement of the spillover is going to be to compare outcomes for obligatory ties uh, across the two treatment arms. So um, our and, and the hypothesis here is that uh, transfers to altruistic ties should increase more in those um, in, the, in the treatment group as in the post in the control group. Transfers to the, uh, to the obligatory ties should, should behave the opposite. Um, and, and we would expect the welfare gains uh, as measured as consumption or amount saved uh, among the, the altruistic ties should increase uh, in, for those ties attached to the, to the treatment group as opposed to those in the, in the control group and vice versa again for the, um, for the obligatory. So uh, with that, I don't have any more time, so unfortunately I'll have to skip this. Uh, but uh, again, I want to also personally thank uh, IMTFI for the opportunity to start this project. Uh, also, we would like to thank uh, uh, EDGS from Northwestern for providing additional funding that has made the, the rest of the project possible. But without the initial input of, uh, uh, I, the initial input of IMTFI has been uh, absolutely fundamental. Thank you. Well, we have almost 20 minutes for questions and uh, response from, from the panelists. I, I wanted to point out one thing, just for fun. Uh, uh, across all of the papers, uh, remarkably, they all had some notion of, uh, well, some explicitly used the term value, uh, and uh, others had a, a notion of wealth. And um, in almost all of the papers, uh, there was kind of an assumption that value is the same as wealth, and wealth um, is in terms of a money price uh, of something that's being exchanged. And, um, but there's a tension in all the papers too, uh, because that relationship uh, is not stable. Um, we could also think that value can actually be the object that's referred to by something with a money price. And since things with a money price are exchangeable in markets, uh, then this object that's referred to is something that's common to all of these things. Um, but what is remarkable from all the papers is that, uh, that, this, that, that this is not natural, <laughs> nor is it eternal, um, nor is it universal. Um, but it nevertheless is a durable representational tendency. Uh, and most of the tension in all of the papers was the effort to put this representational tendency in place uh, and the existence of other representational tendencies uh, that work uh, against it. Um, I won't say anything more, but uh, you know, another way to think about this is that uh, this one representational tendency, one where some sort of common amorphous object is pulled out and presented uh, in the for as a form of uh, 
in, in a form through money price. Um, it's uh, when that dominates, we could say that within any social whole, that's a dominant value. Uh, but when other relations push against it, uh, we could say those are other values uh, pushing against it. And in fact, all of the papers contained exactly that tension. Uh, and uh, they each explore in different ways uh, how to kind of put in place certain relations and uh, make perhaps diminish other ones or augment other ones. So I'll, at this point, we should turn it over to specific questions for the panelists. Thank you. And if you want to raise your hand and then call the particular speaker uh, or panelist, you may do that, and then it can just happen directly. Then I don't have to uh, kind of mediate. Another option would be to take several questions and then let the panel as a whole uh, pick and choose what they want to respond to. At least we have one question right now. Um. Hello. Um, this is for Alfredo and Cynthia. I, I, I thought the, the design was very interesting, and I, there's, I just have two points to, it's both a comment and something I just want to, uh, and a question perhaps. Um, the first thing that came to mind when you, you, when you described an experimental approach was, uh, I saw the study I mentioned yesterday, yesterday by Acker, Jenny Acker, about uh, ZAP. So they also did the experimental design um, but one thing that they did was they had, aside from their control, they also wanted to uh, control for the impact of the phone itself. So um, you had one group that had it through mobile cash, another with cash alone, and then another with cash plus mobile, just to make sure that it's not the mobile that's having an effect. That's the one thing I, I, rem I, I recalled about that design. Um, the other thing that uh, was interesting to me was uh, that you wanted to look at the impact of mobile money on social networks. And recently I came across an article about, I think it is in Time, that says um, they wanted to look at the impact of religion on charitable giving. And they said it's not so much the religion, the religious aspect that makes differences in giving, but rather it's the social ties. So here, your design was a little different, but I, I thought it might make sense to also try to control in terms of looking at what are the, because I think what you did was you tried to document what, who are your social ties. Maybe you could also want to, you may want to take into consideration that aspect of religiosity and then think of how, sort of like inverting the, the, the relationship. Should, should we answer? Yes, yes, please, I think. Just we can go back and forth in a relaxed manner. Okay. Um, yeah. So th thank, thank you so much for, for those for those comments. Um, yeah, I think our, our work is definitely in a in a similar spirit to some of, of Jenny Aker's work. I, here, I think maybe one thing that's worth keeping in mind is that we're not actually providing anyone with a with a phone. Although we are we are providing uh, an individual who doesn't have a Zantel account and and wants. Um, or, or one who wants a second account, we'll, we'll provide them with a SIM card. But so we're, we're not, we're, in our setting, it's I think the maybe confounding effects of having a, this, this device that you can use to, to make calls or get price information or et, et cetera is, is gonna be less just, just given our design, but that's, that's definitely, I, although I guess to the extent that using easy pace that causes people to use their phones more for other reasons, that might be something interesting to look at, at, at the, in, the, in the end line survey. Um, and then I think uh, on this, Point on, on on religion. Uh, I think that's also a really interesting one. We, we 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 did we did in fact ask people sort of who they who they might go to go to the mosque with, um, um, and something that we may this would have uh, you know something that we may be able to do once we get our online data is to see whether the effects differ maybe either according to whether the two ties are of, of the same religion or, or whether the effects differ by the by the religion uh, you know or the uh, uh, some member of the you know some 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 measure of the kind of religious uh, nature of, of the tie. I don't know, if you, Alfred, if you wanted to add anything. Uh, yeah, so I guess I, only a couple of other comments here. So I think the paper that you referred to uh, had what you would imagine having multiple treatment arms, and so uh, you can explore more things. And here we have a very simple design. There's only one treatment and one control group. Uh, but that really was brought by mm, not our 
willingness to just study one thing. I, we, we wish we would study a lot more things, but um, because we're trying to really look at small social, social changes in, in, and that are probably gonna be fairly, fairly soft, very, very, fairly small, we really need to have a very large sample size. And so we couldn't afford to actually have multiple intervention with just cash or uh, providing a savings account of one type or, or, or another. So um, that's maybe one of the right, maybe limitations of our, yes. But, and, and thank you for your comment on the, on the religiosity. That's actually quite uh, good, to, uh, good to know, thanks. Hi, I'm in the back. <laughs> Yeah, hi, I'm Taylor Nelms. I'm a graduate research assistant here at IMTFI. Um, and I also have a question for Alfredo and, and Cynthia. Uh, two questions, really. The, the first one, I just, I wanna know how the algorithm works. I don't know if um, you have the time to explain that to us, but maybe later. Um, the second question is, is more specific. Um, you mentioned on one of your slides very quickly that those ties that were ranked by that algorithm as altruistic, 53% of them were also ranked by the people as um, being of the same wealth level, right? Um, but that means that 46% right were not. And I think for that 46% is really interesting, right? Who are the people who are not of the same wealth level who were ranked by the algorithm as being altruistic ties? And I wanna know more about those relationships. Okay, okay uh, so I mean, that, maybe we can talk about the details of the algorithm uh, l later. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, we're happy to talk about that at, at great length, but maybe, I'll, uh, yeah, in the interest of, of time. Um, as, as for the 46% the of altruistic uh, ties who are of, of different wealth level, I wish I, wish I had here the, the breakdown. I, I, seemed, I, I recall that it's fairly evenly split between less wealthy than, than me and, and more, more wealthy than, than me. Um, and I, I think I guess something that we should, that we should explore more, we, we've, we've gotten access to this baseline data relatively recently, but um, uh, you know, I think it would be interesting to look at how that breaks down. Um, you know, amongst you know, for instance, your 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 parent, you know, elderly parents may in general be le may, may be likely to be less wealthy than you, but but may also tend to be an altruistic tie. And so, something that we could do is you know, kind of a multivariate analysis to to see you know if, if it's other characteristics that are that are ex explaining you know, explaining who who ends up you know, uh, yeah, whether it's whether it, whether wealth differences per se are our first order for this, or, or whether this is kind of correlated with other with other factors. So that's that's definitely something we'll we'll look into more now that we have the data. Um, not harping on the same thing, but with <laughs> Cynthia and Alfredo, I have something else for someone else after that. But um, uh, what's your prior on how much people are going to need to save to find the effects plausibly linked to the savings itself? You know, one of the uh, things with Sylvia's work in Nepal is that those are such small amounts that they saved, it's a little hard to believe that the effects you see really are savings linked effects as opposed to something else. Um, and then uh, sort of the, with Islamic finance, just two quick things. One, you know, the, uh, two of the five or six largest microfinance networks in the world are Christian. And your comments about the, the role of women and the empowerment of women, it hadn't occurred to me in the Islamic context, but then that sort of opened up this door of, uh, you know, what is the marketing and the thinking within Opportunity International and Hope International and World Vision and how they market, because they do explicitly market women's empowerment to another religious group where you can make some arguments about how exactly they feel about women's empowerment. Um, so it would be an interesting thing to look at that comparison. Um, and then secondly, uh, Bob, Cull et al. have done a lot of work about how changes in environment affect the behavior of nonprofit versus for-profit microfinance institutions around the world. And so with this sort of run on the Islamic Bank, it might be interesting to look at that in the context of you know, what they were looking at was uh, uh, changes in the cost of regulation and how nonprofits reach out to fewer people but maintain a focus on the poorest clients, but for-profits maintain their outreach but serve wealthier clients whenever that happens and across the broad context. But, so it might also be interesting to compare there. Sure. Um, on that last issue, uh, I actually just got back from 
two months in Pakistan as a taking a break from the IMDFI research, um, doing a consultancy for Islamic Relief, and that gave me an opportunity to look at an NGO MFI as opposed to a state bank regulated uh, financial institution. And yeah, the, the regulatory environments for Islamic microfinance, depending on if it's being done by a bank under the purview of a state bank or under an NGO, completely changes the, the discourse, the expectations, um, funding structures, and then comes down to affect the types of products and services that are offered. So that's huge, the kind of institution it is. And I would argue that there's going to be really different relationships um, on a prima facie level between an NGO and a bank if they're offering something like Islamic microfinance and how that relates to its own internal structures. So the Islamic Bank's uh, Islamic microfinance program is under the rubric of their own CSR initiatives. But if you're an NGO and your whole purpose, your whole raison d'etre is development, then you know, you're not going to be able to claim any kind of additional you know, value in terms of what you're you know, providing as both a for-profit but also a you know, an entity that then has this development-oriented uh, program as well. And then with regards to the, the marketing, that thank you for that suggestion. I haven't looked at how um, Christian NGOs have been talking about something like women's empowerment and linking that to what's happening in a Bangladeshi context. Um, when I talk to the, the people at the Islamic Bank about this focus on family uplif upliftment versus women's empowerment, they couch it um, both as Islamic and also deeply Bangladeshi. So they're saying it's not just about religion for them, but it's also a need to, we want to increase um, liquidity available to families. We don't want to alter the cultural fabric that's in play. That's not our role, that's not our job. We're really just looking to provide more money to people. So they, there's, there's an effort to, to disassociate it from Islam because the Islami Bank is very self-aware of its problems with perception in Bangladesh and the fact that it's contentious. They love the fact that non-Muslims bank with them because they see that as being a counter to the argument that, look, we're supporting, you know, people, su we're, we're, you know, we're not just supporting the Islamic political party, we're not just about, um, you know, promoting greater expressions of public Islam, we, we provide a superior product for the poor. Um, so they focus on, on the fact that a, a family-oriented unit rather than an individual is a more Bangladeshi thing to do rather than a more Islamic thing to do. But thank you for the suggestion. Um, so then on, on this question of sort of how, how, much, how much saving do we kind of think that we, we might need to, to see effects, I mean, I think, I think one thing that, um, so there, there's a interesting kind of old, older paper by Angus Deaton that sort of shows in a simulation-based framework that you can actually get pretty big welfare gains from savings with, with, with amounts of savings that are on average, on, on average quite, quite, quite low. And so, you know, uh, the, sort of the amount of, the amount of buffer that you, that you need to, uh, you know, to, to cushion a pretty significant amount of your, your risk can, can be, you know, on the order of like 10% of your, you know, permanent income, let, let's, let's say. So, so that's kind of a, a, a quasi-theoretical argument as to why we, we might see meaningful effects even if the amounts saved on, on average are, are not are not large. And, and I, I guess sort of related to that, um, especially when you think about the mechanisms for the negative spillovers, they kind of re rely on this uh, you know, off, off equilibrium behavior of you know, if, if the social network taxes me too much, then, then I'm going to uh, withdraw from that network and, and start using this other technology. But that, that doesn't even necessarily have to happen in, in equilibrium. It could just be that the, the interpersonal transfers are are, are renegotiated to, to a level that respects that new outside option. And so, I mean, I don't want to push this too far, but you, again, you could see big changes in behavior without necessarily having a lot of actual use of, of the savings technology. Now, that, that said, we, we, we certainly are uh, hoping and expecting that, that households will, will, will use the savings technology, and, you know, and I think that's consistent with, uh, uh, with, with the findings of, of Sylvia's work and Pascaline and, and Pascaline Dupont and John, John Robinson's work. But, um, but but yeah, I think it is worth worth keeping, and you know, or at least it gives us some some additional kind of opti optimism. Is the wrong word, uh, but um, we I don't think we necessarily need the savings balances to be, on average, very high to, to potentially see some interesting effects. Uh, and if I may add to add on empirical side, uh, if if you look at Sylvia's work, it, it is she has found the effect on on savings uh, with her intervention. But also she has a follow-up paper where she really finds also that self-reported measures of the social network changed 
uh, after the intervention. So uh, that the, now I don't remember exactly what the details are, but um, it, it does seem that her intervention also elicited uh, changes in, in, in the structure and the, the amount of transfers given to, uh, to, to your social network. Um, so with that, our intervention tries to all look at a similar thing, but actually getting the information directly from the network. So hopefully we will get uh, not self-reported data, but it will be more uh, reported by the actual by the by the actual network. Okay, we are on schedule. It's ten thirty, and according to the program, we shall take a thirty-minute break. Uh, 